This is CBC Vancouver News. It feels um, kind of sad because um, I had a lot of good memories here. But then again, I get to do things differently. Tonight on CBC Vancouver News, the slow road to rebuilding. After wildfires wiped out their homes, we check in with some people in West Kelowna. Plus. It's concerned. What's at the root cause of it? What are we doing? More than a dozen stabbings in four months in Victoria. The city's police chief and mayor address mounting concerns and deconstructing Cram Park. Some campers saying they're left with nowhere to go. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Zara Premji. It's been a slow, sometimes painful process for people to rebuild their homes destroyed by the devastating wildfires in West Kelowna last August. So far, only 10 homeowners have applied for and received permits. As we head into another wildfire season, Brady Strachan caught up with some of the people trying to start all over again. So my house was here. This would have been the yard. From Mariko Nagata, returning to the empty lot where her home once stood brings back tough emotions. Well, it doesn't feel great. Yeah. <laughs> it feels um, kind of sad because um, I had a lot of good memories here. The aggressive fire last summer scorched Nagata's home to the foundations, along with the home across the street, while many others in the neighborhood survived. It's just luck of the draw, Mother Nature. So you just never know. For the past eight months, she's been dealing with her insurance company, a long and complicated process to recoup all that she lost. It's stressful, for sure, but also there's not too much I can do about that, so I just concentrate on the things that I can do something about. So When the one-year anniversary of the fire comes this August, Nagata hopes to be rebuilding and carving out a new chapter in her life. Other people have started, so... Um, I'm hoping it's going to be soon. The McDougall Creek wildfire destroyed or damaged structures on nearly 200 properties last summer. While many lots have been cleared of debris, local government officials say they've only issued 10 building permits to people whose homes were damaged or destroyed. Just outside West Kelowna, the rural Bear Creek Road neighborhood was one of the worst hit areas by the fire. The blackened forest here, a vivid reminder of the destruction the fire left in its wake. I think the biggest part was seeing it come over the mountain because then you knew that... It Tammy Thomas is eager to get back on her property. So I built this. Yeah, it's all recycled materials. She's already rebuilding her life, bringing her animals back to the land. So we got Luce Squeal, a.k.a. Lucy. Thomas, too, is dealing with her insurance adjuster and now waiting on bids from contractors. It's slow. It really a lot of patience like you it tests your patience i'm doing a lot of meditations and while the process to get rebuilding can be frustrating thomas says instead of dwelling on the past destruction she and many of her neighbors are just eager to move forward for us we're like we want to rebuild we love this property brady strachan cbc news west Kelowna. The 2024 federal budget has officially been delivered and there aren't many surprises. Housing affordability is perhaps the biggest ticket item in it and it's one of the largest challenges facing people in this province. Michelle Gassou breaks down what's in the federal budget for BC. Budget 2024 honed in on housing and young people. Do you rent or own? I don't know. I live with my parents. Okay, yeah, okay. classic. In Canada's most expensive province, people say they expect the federal government to help get the housing situation under control. There's a bunch of infrastructure that's not being used right now, and I think that it could be utilized in a way more efficient way. For young people, I definitely like the 5% and 10% incentive that they gave to help with homes the last number of years. If they could do more of that, that's great. Today's budget includes $8.5 billion in new spending on housing and a promise to build 3.9 million homes by 2031. But the feds are also looking at some more creative options, like turning Department of Defense properties into homes. One of those under consideration, the Armory in Vernon. And if you've ever wanted to live in a post office, Canada Post properties are also being assessed, including those in North Vancouver and Port Moody. 
Ottawa is also looking at six other Canada Post properties across BC that could become homes. This is real catch up. And, you know, I, I really hope any future governments that come on will actually heed this, that this is what's really needed right now. Um, we need more nonprofit housing being built. We need more purpose built rental being built. In some ways, B.C. and the feds are already in line on the housing file. After precedent setting, B.C. builds legislation was introduced in February. Other provinces are now expected to meet the benchmark set in this province to access that federal funding. Ideally, there will be a greater uptake uh, in B.C. of some of these federal initiatives because there is alignment um, between the provincial and federal government to... Um, to, to you know, increase the supply of overall supply of housing. Still, the housing crisis in this province feels particularly dire. It is obviously appealing, but they have been saying that for the past couple of years, and it just seems like it's getting worse. Renters, owners, and hopeful buyers alike will have to wait and see whether the measures make a dent. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police say a man has now been charged with second-degree murder in the stabbing death of a woman on the south side of the city. It happened April 3rd. The victim, identified as 49-year-old Gertrude Chong, died after officers found her on the ground near Fraserview Golf Course. Police say 29-year-old Eric Lau from Burnaby was arrested the next day. He's now charged with second-degree murder. Police also say Lau and Chong did know each other, but wouldn't say how. Meanwhile, police say a suspect has been charged after another man was mistakenly shot in the face in downtown Vancouver on April 3rd. The BC Prosecution Service charged Justin Delaney Littlewolf with one count of discharging a firearm, contrary to Section 244.1 of the Criminal Code, and one count of aggravated assault. Police say Little Wolf is accused of shooting a 46-year-old man near Homer and West Pender Street. The force says the victim was not the intended target. While he is expected to survive, police say his physical and emotional injuries will last a long time. Well, a man accused of stabbing two food delivery drivers this past December during a robbery has pleaded guilty. It happened here in Olympic Village. Sheldon Ilbegi Asley was charged with theft under $5,000 and two counts of assault with a weapon. The 21-year-old is accused of using pepper spray on someone he met when he was buying a computer graphics card. When he fled, two food delivery people tried to intercept him and he stabbed them. Ilbeg Asley, his lawyer rather, has asked the court to order a psychiatric assessment to address addiction and mental health diagnosis and treatment. While well, Victoria's police chief and mayor are speaking up over a series of recent knife attacks, some of them deadly. While the numbers are similar to previous years, it has some officials worried. Police are calling this string of stabbings and violent incidents with weapons a growing trend officers are seeing on the streets. In the first four months of the year, Victoria police say there have been 20 assaults with a knife, similar numbers to the last four years. But Police Chief Delmonic says there is a rise in knives and edged weapons being carried by people for protection. When you see the frequency of the stabbings and the violence playing out in our communities, uh, I can't tell you, really, with any confidence to say, well, it's okay, you know, we're safe and it's going to be okay, the numbers don't really, you know, are kind of aligned to what it has been for the last four years. Um, it's concerning, and, and I think that we, we're going to be getting into this, is what's at the root cause of it, what are we doing? The Downtown Victoria Business Association says its many businesses are being impacted and it wants to spend more time marketing its own events downtown instead of putting most of its energy into dealing with violence. A panel discussing how to make communities safer was held earlier today in Victoria. Housing officials, mental health advocates and police discussed ways to make people feel safer in their city and their homes. Vancouver Park Rangers have been removing some tents at Crab Park and asking others to take down temporary structures. Today's enforcement focused on a hillside outside of designated temporary sheltering area. But as Joel Ballard reports, some campers say they have nowhere else to go. For people like Z, being forced to pack up their belongings at Crab Park is a familiar feeling.
She was a camper at Oppenheimer Park as well. I was decamped at that time and I'm going to be decamped again even though I have nowhere to be. Vancouver Park Rangers moved into Crab Park in the morning, telling people to tear down their tents. Z says she lost many of her belongings the last time she was told to move, and she's worried history is repeating itself. Literally, they're going to take everything I need to keep myself safe, warm and dry, and mobilized, and I'm going to be left with nothing. Campers on site were given time to pack up. For those who weren't there, park rangers threw out their tents. You're forcibly removing someone's home and you're putting all of their belongings into the garbage can. Some bystanders objected. The woman who lives in that tent wasn't here at the moment. She's going to return to a blank piece of grass with her tent and all her belongings somewhere. Park rangers were enforcing a bylaw on behalf of the Vancouver Park Board. It requires temporary shelters to be taken down during daytime hours. The board says that's to balance the needs of those who want to visit the park during the day. Less than a month ago, the city cleared people from this encampment to clean the area. They set up a designated site where campers could leave their tents up. But advocates say the city only made room for 14 tents. There's so many people that have been staying on this hillside, just desperately clinging to the hill, waiting for the chance to move into that designated area so they'd have some protection and be able to stay there until they can get housing. York says those asked to leave were not offered housing. Usually what happens is when people lose all their belongings, they end up going to somewhere that's even more and more remote, more precarious, more risky. For Z, the immediate future is very uncertain. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to go tonight and, and indefinitely. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. A Saskatchewan man accused of abducting his daughter and taking her to B.C. to avoid her getting the COVID-19 vaccine appeared in court today in Regina. Michael Gordon Jackson is representing himself at the trial. As Adam Hunter tells us, he called himself as the defense's first and only witness. Michael Gordon Jackson told the jury that he did not want his seven-year-old daughter vaccinated against COVID-19 in the fall of 2021. He shared custody with the girl's mother, but the mother had final say on matters of health and education. When he could not get a guarantee that the girl's mother would not vaccinate the seven-year-old against COVID-19, he decided to take matters into his own hands. He said based on the research he had done, he felt the vaccine was unsafe. So he took his daughter from Saskatchewan to BC. In February of 2022, he was arrested in Vernon, British Columbia. On the stand, Jackson told his version of events that led him to take his daughter without her mother's blessing. He says he did not believe a court would rule in a timely matter and call the situation desperate. During cross-examination, Jackson said that he took his daughter for two and a half months and that no one knew where they were. Well, he disagreed that what he did was extreme, although to his knowledge, he was the only parent in Canada to have taken this sort of action. He said, and I quote, it may seem extreme, but I felt I did the right thing. Jackson wrapped up his case without calling any other witnesses. Final arguments and the jury charge will happen on Thursday. Adam Hunter, CBC News, Regina. And he's back. Emerson, the juvenile elephant seal, who's caused quite a splash for his urban forays in Victoria, has returned to the capital region. And while Emerson fans might be happy to have him back, there is concern over his return and his apparent fondness for human attention. We caught up with people to talk about a seal who seems to like the spotlight. A neighbor of ours who happened by this morning pointed him out that he's uh, in residence here. I did get to know him last year yeah. when he was in the Songhees where I live and he he's a character. He's highly intelligent mm -hmm. and you try and figure out what's making him work but I think he's just like a teenager. He's kind of trying out different things. He it got taken away a couple of weeks ago, yeah. put in a big van and taken well, it seemed to me hundreds of miles away, and he's found his way back. How can he do that? It's really hard to say why a seal picks the particular beach, but it obviously has got everything that he needs, wants right now. And of course, this is a time of year when the elephant seals don't, they can't be at sea. They have to be on land. So he's picked a great spot and he's, he's sticking with it. We were getting multiple reports of people trying to pet him, uh, you know, getting their dogs to introduce uh, themselves to him. 
Uh, in one more egregious incident, uh, it was reported that somebody with their small child was getting uh, them to go up and touch their nose to to the seals. You know, and it's it's only going to end in tragedy. So the determination was made just because of the crowds he was drawing uh, that we needed to move him. You know, he doesn't have GPS, so <laughs> how does he uh, how does he know which way to go? It's uh, I was actually on the team that brought him to his new location and it was a perfect ele- elephant seal uh, molting habitat, but he decided he liked Victoria more and and keeps coming back. So uh, yeah, an incredible feat, like you said, 34 kilometers a day, pretty much straight to get back here and found himself right back in Victoria again. I don't understand why we're getting, they're increasing it and we still get crummy service. To have it or not to, the back and forth on a new rapid bus route in Burnaby continues. More on that after the break. Thanks for sticking with us during our commercial free live stream. In Edmonton, golfers have almost 20 courses they can play. Several are right in the center of the city. But is that the best use of space for a growing region? A professor at the University of Alberta sat down with Radioactive's Mindari Wall to make his case for why the city ought to change some of those golf courses into spaces everyone can enjoy. The only thing that can happen on those courses during golf season is golf. I enjoy running and cycling in the River Valley, Mm -hmm. and I'm very much aware that, especially during golfing season, which is about to start, of course, all of those spaces are off limits for other uses. There are 19 golf courses in Edmonton within the city limits and six on municipal land. 20% of the River Valley and Ravine system is dedicated to this one sport. Have any other cities taken this step of removing municipally owned golf courses to make more public green space? A lot of cities are certainly thinking about it, and one of the reasons for that is that demand for golf is, is declining uh, over the long term. And the city of Ottawa actually is the one example that springs to mind. They did have one municipal golf course, and they closed it uh, to allow it to be repurposed as a park um, to meet that, that need for other forms of recreation. Our city is growing. We're growing quite rapidly. We're going to have 2 million people here by 2050. And that's going to mean a lot more demand for recreational space, uh, especially in the center of the River Valley. And that's where five of the six municipal courses are located, right uh, in some of the most accessible and sought after parts of the River Valley, will there be increasing demand for all sorts of recreation in the future and not just golf. Transit riders in North Burnaby are asking the city to support a new rapid bus route. But the area's business association says it's worried it could hurt local stores. David Ball has more on the transit tussle. Burnaby Heights, an area growing rapidly with new developments. But a battle is brewing over public transit. 
Some local residents say a lot more buses are needed with current routes already plagued by crowding and delays. There's sometimes where the like there's other buses that are late which we don't understand why. But yeah, we do need to better the service. And I don't understand why we're getting they're increasing it and we still get quite crummy service. TransLink has plans to connect North Vancouver with Burnaby's Metro Town by rapid bus in the next 10 years. And Burnaby Transit advocates want it to include an all-day rapid bus lane along Hastings. The population is increasing, traffic's not going to get better and parking is not going to get better. So really the only thing we can do for our long-term planning is to propose new and better modes of transportation that's going to make it easier and better to move more people and get them where they need to go in the neighbourhood. But on the other side, the Heights Merchants Association has concerns. It says it supports improving transit, but fears any new full-time rapid bus lanes could hurt local shops by taking away parking. So with 360 businesses, we currently have 735 parking public parking spaces. And that sounds like a lot, but it's only two parking spaces per business. So when someone suggests, oh, you know, what are they making a big deal about losing one parking space? One parking space represents 50% of our business of our parking. TransLink says there's no actual plan for a dedicated bus lane just yet and both groups will be heard ahead of any public consultations if one is proposed. Advocates say that's welcomed news. Pardon the pun but we're trying to get a little bit ahead of the bus and be involved in conversations really early because if we can solve these problems now I'd rather be doing that than reacting to everything after everything's been decided. TransLink says that any debate is welcome on public transit improvements in the region. David Ball, CBC News, Burnaby. All right, here's a live shot of Burrard Inlet facing the North Shore. Darius will have your full forecast next. Well, it's National Volunteer Week in Canada. In Saskatchewan, 10 volunteers were recognized for their decades of service, including a woman who fought for labor rights for working mothers. When my daughter was born, I wanted to come back. Childcare was a big issue, as it is today for a lot of mothers. Um, I wanted to come back to work um, part-time. And um, I actually wanted to job share with another woman who also had a child the same age. And so we went to our boss and we said, look, we have this arrangement. I will work in the morning, she'll come in the afternoon and we can look after each other's children. And our boss said, no, that is not something that is acceptable. And we're talking about 1970. 980 in those eras. So one of the areas I'm very passionate about, I see women um, moving forward with that, is that this became a big issue and I was on a national advisory committee to try and look at different options for parents to work at. And uh, with the national advisory committee, we went in on to uh, collective agreements that look after leave with income averaging, part-time work, um, you know, women that can work um, in the winter months so that they're not working in the summer when children are home. Those kind of initiatives that are now in a lot of collective agreements. The other one was we really pushed uh, EI to try and have um, programs that allowed you to collect EI that was topped up and things like that. So it went through the collective agreement, but it really came through the National Advisory Committee. So that is my, that is my proud moment. Yeah. Kested says she was inspired by her father, who moved the family to Canada from Kenya in the 1960s. She says as an immigrant woman and working mother in the early 80s, she faced a lot of discrimination. Lieutenant Governor Russ Morasti says the Saskatchewan Volunteer Medals honoured people who went above and beyond for others without expecting anything in return.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On May 9th, join CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Surrey Board of Trade's Top 25 Under 25 Awards, celebrating the incredible initiatives of Surrey's youth. And CBC Vancouver is the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd at 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival information, visit doxafestival.ca. The Canucks have clinched first place in the Pacific Division with the win against the Flames tonight in the final home game of the regular season. Here's Miller in the Markstrom Stars. There's JT Miller, the Canucks' leader in points, putting the game away. 4-1 to one for the home team and win number 50 for only the third time in team history. The Canucks have one more game on the road Thursday in Winnipeg. And with a win for Vancouver and a loss for Dallas, the Canucks could still finish on top of the Western Conference. While the torch has been lit, the relay is underway and the countdown to the 2024 Paris Olympic Games has begun. Usually the power of the sun is used to light the flame with a parabolic mirror, but it has, rather it was too cloudy in Olympia, Greece today. The 2024 Paris Games start on July 26th, and you can catch all the action right here on CBC. The weather update is brought to you by Direct by Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, call Direct by Furnace. Installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. All right, so let's bring in Darius Madavi to check out what's happening in the week of weather. Darius, I've had my sunnies out, but can I get my wellies out as well? Yes, you can. Uh, on the way, some scattered light showers this weekend. But first, we've got a long stretch of uh, cool but sunny and dry weather for the next few days. Big thanks to this high pressure system. Now, in the fancy weather speak, this is called an omega block. It's a very short lived one, so I'm not sure it quite deserves the name because it's not quite blocking much, but it will deflect any weather systems that are coming on shore thanks to that high pressure. Uh, we have a low pressure system here, so you can see the jet stream would come down and around the low pressure system, up around the high, and then down around the low again, which is why it's called an omega block. It looks like the Greek letter omega. Now, that high pressure system is going to move over BC in the next uh, 24 hours or so, stay over the province, keeping us sunny, dry, maybe with the exception of the southeast, which may see a few more showers, a few more clouds over the next few days. But then, as that high pressure continues to move east, they get the dry and sunny weather. And here on the coast this weekend, Saturday, maybe Sunday, we get a few showers courtesy of that trough of lower pressure that is going to be shoving some weather systems potentially our way. Just some light showers, more than likely. Nothing too severe, it looks like right now. Uh, and hard to say whether it will happen on Sunday at all, to be fair. So, with that being said, all that precipitation that we have seen clearing out now, nothing but a few very isolated showers possible tomorrow. Very little cloud breaking into the province at all over the next few days. And then you can see the beginnings of that next weather system that may be coming in, but not for a long time yet. Now, if we take a look at our temperatures, you can see slowly coming up in the interior over the next few days here on the coast. We're turning too seasonal or just above, uh, a little bit longer to recover in those parts of the interior. But by the weekend, they will be warmer again. We will have another little tiny drop, but seriously, Nothing too exciting happening on the weather front this week. Conditions staying calm and sunny, as I said. A little bit more activity for parts of the southeast, uh, but really we're talking uh, sunny conditions. We're talking uh, cool but warm. I mean, not cool in the interior, but still warm here on the coast. Uh, and then we get you get your showers on the weekends, Zara. So something for everybody. All right, I'll take those Saturday showers. Thanks, Darius. Thank you. And that's your late news for this Tuesday evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, you know what I'm going to say before you let that head hit the pillow. Why don't you take one last scroll through cbc.ca slash bc to see what else is making headlines. Have a fantastic evening.